let's recap where we are right now. So what we figured out over the last few lectures is that business cycles happen because of changes in aggregate demand. And aggregate demand is going to refer to that left-hand side of the equation of exchange, that m times v. Now that's only going to be part of the explanation. Business cycles happen when aggregate demand changes and when the price level is sticky. Right? If prices were not sticky, if prices adjusted immediately, then we wouldn't get any kind of wrong prices. We wouldn't get these disequilibria where you have quantity supply is greater than quantity demanded or vice versa. Right? But when prices are sticky, real income is going to fluctuate temporarily. So what we're going to ask today is why aggregate demand changes in the first place. And there's two basic ways that this can happen. Either the money supply can change or money demand can change, which is to say velocity changes. Right? These are exhaustive. There's no other ways that the volume of spending can change. If the price level changes, the price level never changes on its own. That's always in response to something else. So P is never going to move on its own. If real income changes, and neither the money supply nor velocity changes, that's going to affect the price level. Right? So you're going to get an equal and opposite movement in the price level as you get in real income. Right? So those are going to cancel out, and the product of P and Y is going to stay the same if neither M nor V changes. Right? So anytime aggregate demand changes, we know that it's either the money supply or money demand. So why do those happen? That's going to be the question we're going to ask today. And we're going to be able to break this down into four basic types of business cycle events. Two of them are going to be booms. Two of them are going to be recessions. For booms, right? booms can happen either because the money supply rises or money demand falls, which is to say that velocity rises. People are demanding less money, so they would rather spend it than hold it. And so the velocity, the flow of that money through the economy is going to increase, and the volume of spending is going to rise. We're also going to have two types of recessions. Either the money supply falls, or the demand for money rises, which is to say that velocity falls. Right? People are demanding to hold more money rather than to spend it, so that flow of money through the economy is going to slow down. Velocity is going to fall. So we're going to ask, what kinds of things cause all these situations to happen. And we're going to run through each of them one by one. So let's start with changes in the money supply. And we're going to be able to break this into two different types of money supply changes. So we're actually going to get six types of business cycle events rather than four. All right, so remember that there are different measures of the money supply. We have our M0, that's just base money, and we have our M1 and M2. That also includes bank-issued money. All right, so M0 is going to be issued directly by the central bank. That's our base money. And it's going to be a kind of a small portion of the total money supply in the economy. All right, whereas we also have measures that include bank-issued money. That's going to be the majority of what you and I think of as our money balances. And these are going to be much bigger. Right? And the way that these change is going to be somewhat different, and we're going to analyze these in a different kind of way. And remember that M0, our base money, is under the direct control of the central bank. So whenever the Fed decides M0 should be different than what it is, then M0 is going to change. And that's going to be a different kind of explanation than the situations under which bank money change. So if the Federal Reserve has the power to decide how much M0 there is in the economy, maybe the commercial banks that issue M2, maybe they have the power to decide how much bank-issued money is in the economy. And that's not really true. Right? So we might want to know, if banks have the power to issue money, why don't they just issue infinite amounts of money? Right? If you had the power to issue money, wouldn't you just print as much of it as you possibly could and then go spend it? Why don't you do that? Or why don't banks do that? Well, here's the thing. Bank money, remember, is a promise to pay. Right? It's a promise to pay in terms of base money. And what makes those promises money, what makes them act like money, is that people believe that that promise is good. And if people stop believing that promise is good, then they're not going to be able to serve as money anymore. 
right? So if the only way you're able to issue money is if people believe that you're gonna be able to pay it back, right, that's gonna place a pretty hard limit on you, right? In that respect, you're no different than a bank. Right? You could issue promises and spend those as money if you could get people to believe you. But that's the hard part, right? So banks invest a lot of effort into making sure that people believe them, into building up their credibility. And this limits them in the amount of money they can issue, because if they issue too much, then it's gonna be difficult for them to fulfill those promises. And people aren't gonna believe them, and then all of a sudden, all that money that they issued is gonna be no longer money. So unlike a central bank, private banks, commercial banks, are not gonna be able to just decide how much money they issue. Right? The Federal Reserve can decide that because it's not making any promises. The money that it issues is not a promise to anything, whereas the money that commercial banks issue is a promise to something. So the Federal Reserve right now is unlimited because it's not making a promise, but commercial banks are limited because they are making a promise. Now the Federal Reserve was in the same situation as commercial banks under the gold standard, right? Then it was a promise to pay in terms of gold, right? But it doesn't do that anymore, right? And so it's no longer constrained in the way that it used to be. So then what does determine how much money private banks can issue? Well, there's basically two factors. First of all, the more base money there is in the economy, the more promises banks can issue in total. Right? The more things there are in the economy in terms of which you make promises, the more able you're gonna to be to make those promises. Right? The more money you have, the more promises to money you're gonna be able to make. And the second thing that's gonna determine how much money banks can issue is people's demand for money. Right? The more people are willing to accept your promises and not call those in, the more able you're gonna to be to issue those promises without worrying about fulfilling them. So let's take a step back here and think about what exactly it is that banks do. Right? From your and my perspective, our interactions with a bank are only about half of what banks generally do. Right? So banks in general serve two functions. First of all, they're gonna take deposits. That's how you and I generally interact with banks. Right? We're gonna deposit liquid cash in banks. We're gonna deposit that M0 and we're gonna get back some promises. We're going to get back a bank account with deposit balances. Those are that bank's promises to pay. And those are immediately redeemable, right? There's a reason they're called demand deposits, because whenever I demand, I can walk into that bank and say, hey, I want that cash back, and they have to give it to me. Right? That's the promise that they've made. But the second thing that banks do is that they make loans. Right? If you need a loan to buy a car, or to buy a house, or for any other kind of uh, emergency, right? you can go to the bank, and the bank uh, is generally willing to give that to you on some terms. So what the bank is gonna do is it's gonna take that liquid cash that people deposited in it, and it's gonna loan that out to businesses, especially, who have productive projects that they want to finance, right? Remember, when we talked about the role of banks in making sure that resources flow to their most valued uses. This is that happening in action right now. Right? And the money that they're able to lend out is money that you've given to them. Right now, in exchange for that loan, and it gets back a promise to pay from the borrower. Right? The borrower gets money and promises to pay it back at some future date. So you'll notice here there's kind of a balance. Those of you who are finance majors, you can probably see a balance sheet in this diagram here. And the assets are gonna equal the liabilities. But here's the, here's the issue. Right, you'll notice that the promise the bank makes to you is a lot more generous than the promise that the bank has from its borrowers. Right, you can walk up to the bank anytime and get your money back. Whereas the bank allows the borrower to keep the money until a specified future date, right? The borrower doesn't have to pay that back until sometime in the future. So this is why banks are sometimes called intermediaries, right? They're intermediating funds. They're allowing you to deposit your funds with the bank and then use those funds productively 
in order to create value and then pass some of that created value back on to you in the form of interest on your deposits. So banks are performing a valuable service here, right? Banks are bearing risk because you don't want to lend directly to companies who are making productive projects, right? That's too risky for you. You just want your money to be available to you and maybe earn a little bit of interest. So banks are going to take that money from you, lend it to productive projects, and they're going to bear that risk to where they make a short-term promise to you but receive a long-term promise from the borrower. So the bank bears that risk. And the fact that the promises that they make to you and the promises that they have from their borrowers are mismatched in terms of time means that they're bearing some extra risk if conditions turn sour. So returning now to the conditions under which banks can issue money. Right? The more liquid cash is in the economy and the more people deposit with the banks, the more promises the banks can issue. Right? The more funds that are available to them, the more they can issue in terms of promises. So banks are generally able to issue more promises than the funds that they have available to them. Why are they able to do that? Because banks can generally count on you not coming back and redeeming those promises all at once, right? or at least everybody's not doing that at once. Right? Because bank promises are spendable as money, you're willing to hold bank promises rather than redeem them immediately. And so that frees up a lot of that money to be used for productive purposes and to be loaned out. Now, banks are generally going to keep some amount of reserves. They're going to keep some amount of cash on hand in order to fulfill whatever demand does come in. But that's usually going to be a small proportion of the total promises it's made. Right? But it's going to have to keep some amount. And the amount that it keeps in proportion to its total liabilities, in proportion to all of the promises that it's made, it's right, usually going to be fairly constant in normal times. So if the supply of M0 increases by 10%, that's going to make banks 10% more able to issue their own kinds of promises. So M2, ideally, is also going to increase by 10%, right? because now they have more funds available to fulfill the promises that they make. And they only need 10%, let's say, of the promises that they've made in terms of cash in order to fulfill day-to-day -day promises. Now this ratio here, we'll sometimes call this the money multiplier. Right? The money multiplier is the ratio between M0 and let's say M2. Right? And if the demand for money is constant, then that ratio is going to be more or less constant as well. Now the second factor that determines how much money banks are going to be able to issue is the demand to hold those bank promises. So the more willing people are to hold bank promises rather than to redeem them, then the more promises the bank is going to be able to issue. Remember that the bank is able to issue more promises than it has reserves because not everybody is coming in and redeeming those at once. So the more people are willing to hold those bank promises rather than to redeem them, and to just keep money in their bank accounts, the more promises banks are able to issue and the more loans banks are able to make. So the more you trust the bank, the more you believe that you can spend its promises as money, the more you're going to be willing to hold and the more the bank can issue. Alternatively, if people lose trust in the bank and decide they don't want to hold bank promises, if somebody pays you in terms of bank money and you say, hey, I don't want to hold on to this, I'm going to go to the bank and withdraw that in cash. The more people do that, the less banks are able to issue. And so the money multiplier can actually fall if people lose trust in the bank or if people increase their trust in the bank. If people increase the amount of bank promises that they're willing to hold, the money multiplier can actually increase and you'll get even more M2 for a given amount of M0. Now, the only reason that bank promises can serve as money is if a promise to a dollar is for all intents and purposes as good as a dollar. Now, if everybody thinks that, then bank promises can serve as money. But if people start to doubt it, right? if people start to think, well, maybe the bank's going to have a hard time fulfilling this promise, they can go to the bank, withdraw that money. right? They'd rather have the money than the promise to the money. That's going to limit the bank's ability to make those kinds of promises. And so the supply of bank money in that case is going to fall, even though M0 is staying the same. 
So here's an interesting outgrowth of this principle. Do you ever notice that old banks are generally situated in these grandiose marble buildings? Why is that a thing? Well, because in the 1800s in the US, the banking system was very fragile for a variety of reasons. And occasionally you'd have a situation where somebody would come in and set up a bank and people would deposit their money and the guy would just run off with all the money. And then everybody's kind of out of luck, right? So if you want to set up a bank and at the time branch banking was illegal, so you couldn't just attach yourself to Wells Fargo or something, right? There was no ability to build up that brand name recognition by coming in from elsewhere, right? That was illegal at the time. So if you wanted to convince people that you were trustworthy, you had to convince them that, hey, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not gonna run off with your money. How do you do that? Well, you invest in this big marble building that costs a lot of money to build. And this says, hey, I'm invested in this community. I'm not gonna run off. And the more you do that, the more you're able to convince people that you're here for the long haul, the more they're gonna be willing to trust you and the more loans and deposits you're gonna be able to make. So what does this have to do with the business cycle? Well, sometimes a situation happens where people lose trust in a bank. And if people decide that they don't trust the bank anymore, all of a sudden, if they don't believe that the bank is able to fulfill the promises that it's made, right? And if the bank is not able to fulfill its promises, then this can render all of its promises worthless. Right, so how much is a promise to money worth from somebody who doesn't have any money to pay you back with that? Probably not a lot. Right, so if you start to get wind that the bank is looking a little shaky, right, what do you do? You wanna get there and withdraw your money before everybody else does. And if everybody else has the same thought, everybody rushes to the bank, and this is what we call a bank run. If any of you have seen It's a Wonderful Life, Right, the opening scene is of a bank run. Right? People all of a sudden lose trust in the bank and everybody comes and mobs this poor teller and the teller's trying to say, you know, I've got your money, right? Assets equals liabilities. Uh, if you give me time, when all these businesses we've made loans to pay their loans back, then I can get you your money. But as of right now, right, we're not able to give you all of you your money back all at once, right? Because they've planned for normal redemptions. And if there's abnormal redemptions, something far and away beyond what they've planned for, then that can be bad news for the bank. So banks do plan for normal withdrawals. Right? Banks have reserves on hand to satisfy people who from day to day come in and want cash. Right? But if everybody comes in at once, right, that money's locked up in loans, or a lot of that money's locked up in loans. And so banks can actually fail. if lots of people come in at once. And this ended up being a major factor in the Great Depression, and to some extent in the Great Recession, right? Because all these banks collapse, they're not able to fulfill their promises, and all these promises that were serving as money are now not very worthwhile as promises. They're not very useful as money anymore if people don't believe that they can be paid back. So even if M0 is staying the same, the supply of bank money can fall dramatically with bank failures. This is what happened during the Great Depression. Right? M0 was pretty constant during the whole thing. But because banks were really fragile at the time, because branch banking was illegal, a lot of small banks failed. And because of that, the M2 money supply fell by over a third. And that's a huge factor in why the Great Depression was so severe. Right? In addition to that, as we saw, prices were prevented from falling. So we have all these exacerbating factors. Money supply is falling, prices can't fall, and so spending is going to be slow until that situation rectifies itself, which doesn't happen for nearly a decade. So let's go back to this diagram and think about what happens when banks fail. Suppose that a lot of businesses go under for whatever reason, right? Suppose that Businesses take out loans and for whatever reason, they're not able to pay them back in large proportions, right? So these promises turn worthless and the money coming into the bank kind of dries up. And when people realize this, well, the money that they're giving to the bank, right? The money that they're depositing in the bank 
they stop doing that. Right? They'd rather withdraw the money. Right? So the money coming into the bank from both directions uh, dries up at once. And all of a sudden, you've got a bank with lots of obligations, but no real income. And so the bank has to default as well. During the Great Depression, as I mentioned, it was illegal for banks to have branches. And so one consequence of this is that all these banks' investments, all the loans that they had made, were kind of all in one city. They're all local. And so this is very poorly diversified. So if that city falls on hard times, all of the bank's investments can turn bad at once. Right? You don't have a situation where the bank can diversify, where it can have some loans that do well, some loans that do poorly. Right? All of them are going to be correlated because they're all in that same city. So if a factory closes, or if there's a bad harvest, or anything like that, right, these banks can go fail. And the M2 money supply can actually contract by quite a bit if lots of banks fail this way. Right? You get kind of a snowball effect that way. The story during the Great Recession in 2008 is a little more complicated, but essentially similar. Right, so there's something called the Basel Capital Regulations in the early 2000s that put restrictions on the kinds of assets banks had to hold. And it mandated that they hold certain kinds of safe assets in order to make sure that if the bank failed, they would be able to uh, collect enough money from those assets to repay their depositors. In theory, this sounds good, right? But the problem is that a lot of things were listed as safe assets in these capital regulations that were not really that safe. For example, mortgage-backed securities, right? And the reason mortgage-backed securities were listed as safe assets was to encourage lending to homeowners, right? So if you're a bank and you're being forced to hold all these assets that you don't necessarily want to hold, are you going to hold ones with high return or low return? Probably ones with high return, right? So banks invested in all these risky assets, all these mortgage-backed securities, and made loans to all these subprime homeowners that they wouldn't have otherwise made because they were being incentivized to do so by these Basel regulations. Right, so the home loan business really picked up from the 90s in the 2000s and really contributed to this housing boom. And then when housing prices started to fall, a lot of these subprime borrowers weren't able to pay back the loans that they'd been made. And so the income stream going into the banks dried up and people started to worry. So the amount of money coming into the banks dried up too. And this isn't happening on the level of commercial banks as much. This is happening higher up. This is happening on the level of you know, your M3 and M4. But the effect is the same. Right? A lot of these financial firms had to really contract their issues. They had to pull back in order to be safe again with the amount of money that was coming in. A lot of firms failed, and a lot of liquidity that they were providing based on the assets and the money and the promises that they were issuing, a lot of that just dried up because of that money that was no longer coming back in. Right, so you have all these banks, all these financial firms that are no longer able to fulfill their promises. And just like in the Great Depression, right, these waves of failures and these waves of contractions exacerbated the problem of these loans drying up. Now let me also mention here just how bad this problem can get. Right, because not only is it a problem of the M2 money supply falling, but also this can be reinforced by a fall in velocity. Now, remember what we said about M2 and why we're interested in M2, because M2 tracks what people spend pretty well, right? And it corresponds pretty well to what people think of as their money balances. So even if M0 is staying the same and M2 falls, right, that's money that people were thinking of that they had that they can no longer, right? So people are still gonna be trying to build up their money balances. They're still gonna want more liquidity and they're going to try to increase their money holdings. All right, so not only are you decreasing the supply of money, but also people are going to be trying to withdraw money. People are going to be trying to increase their money holdings just because the economic outlook looks a little more dangerous now. All right, so velocity is going to fall too because the demand for money is rising. So you kind of get a double hit on the volume of spending. 
And so this problem kind of reinforces itself. And that's how we get really bad depressions like 1929 or 2008. So let's look at this in terms of the equation of exchange then. So suppose people lose trust in the bank and they withdraw their money from the bank. Right? They're trying to increase their money holdings, so velocity is going to fall. Right? People are wanting to hold money rather than to spend it, and so the flow of money through the economy is going to slow down. So not only are they increasing their demand for money in general, but they're also increasing their demand for a particular type of money. Right? We'll call this a scramble to safety. They want something that's not a promise, something to where they're not going to lose out. And when they do this, that's going to force commercial banks to contract their issues. And so the money supply is going to fall too. Either they have to contract and reduce the amount that they lend out, or they're going to fail entirely. And all that money that was money is no longer going to be money. So you get this double hit. Right? These problems exacerbate each other. Now you can also imagine this process going in reverse. So let's think of the analogous situation for a boom. So imagine yourself as the guy at the bank who decides what projects to fund. You go out to and fro and look for profitable projects that you can lend money to. And suppose that there's this brand new technology out there that's going to make everybody rich and it's going to hugely increase productivity and it's going to be a big hit. You're going to want to get in on this early, right? Because the earlier you get in on this, the better a return you can make, especially if you get in on it before anybody else does. So banks are maybe going to be more willing to issue money. They're going to be more willing to make extra loans and to run down their reserve ratios if there's this big profitable project, right? if expectations are really high. And if you have deposits at the bank, you might be all right with this because if the bank believes that this is going to be hugely profitable, it's going to pass on those profits to you in the form of interest on your deposits. Right? And if the bank is investing in super profitable projects, right, that makes you happier with how the bank is doing in general. Now this can work out well. This can be a mutually beneficial arrangement. And it's good that banks have the flexibility to do this. Because remember, the purpose of banks is to bear a lot of risk that you're not willing to bear. But just like risk has an upside, Risk also has a downside. Right? You want companies to be able to take risk, but that downside does exist, right? or else it wouldn't be risk. So let me give you an example. 2002, there was a dot-com bubble and a bust. And if you've ever seen this guy here, this is the spokes dog for pets.com. Now pets.com ended up being kind of a poster child for the dot-com bubble. Right, so this is when the internet was brand new, right? and all these computers were now connected, and people had just figured out, oh my gosh, you can sell things on the internet. Everybody's going to make so much money doing this. So everybody got really excited, and all these banks, all these investors, wanted to funnel money into dot-com corporations because they were going to make tons and tons of money here. So this is a situation of higher expected productivity leading to more bank issues, right? So the money supply expanded because people expected more productivity to be available in the future. If that works out, right, M rises, real income rises, and the price level is going to stay about the same, right? And you're not going to get any sort of uh, business cycle that way if it pans out. Now, the problem was in 2002, it really didn't pan out. If anything, it was a little bit too early. Right? So e-commerce did end up becoming a big thing kind of after Amazon, right? after 2002. And all these companies that wanted to sell pet food online and all this higher expected value creation didn't really pan out. Right? So Pets.com is not able to pay back the loan that it got to run a Super Bowl ad. And that's going to put the bank in a lot of trouble. And if you get a lot of failed loans like this all at once, M2 is going to have to contract by quite a bit. And you're going to get a recession after that. Right? Or you could get a recession after that. So this is the S&P 500. Right? And it shows you the ratio of how well tech sector companies are doing to just the general S&P. And what you can see here is a huge run-up in the late 90s and early 2000s. 
So during this run up, you have this new technology where expectations are really high, right? You have high expected productivity. There's gonna be lots and lots of value that gets created. So banks wanna get in on this, they make loans. There's more confidence in banks, so people are more willing to hold bank money and take advantage of these investment opportunities. So M2 is gonna expand. The demand for bank money is gonna rise, and so the supply of bank money is gonna be able to rise, and you get an economic boom, right? This leaks over into the rest of the economy because M2 is rising. Now what happens when that doesn't pan out? Well, once everybody starts to realize that, hey, maybe these high expectations are not going to work out so well, right? There's low realized productivity. Well, the loans start to turn bad and people become less confident in banks as intermediaries of their investments. So they try to pull their money back out. This is going to force banks to contract M2. And this is going to leak out into the economy as well because the entire money supply is now contracting and there's gonna be a recession if the leaks are bad enough. So booms and recessions can be connected this way. Right? If there's high expectations that don't pan out, this can leak out into the broader economy and turn a boom into a recession. Right? You can imagine a situation where this investment would have worked out. In fact, more recently, in the late 20-teens, people were saying there's gonna be another tech boom. And people were looking at all these tech sector companies rising in stock price, you know, your Googles, your Apples, your Facebooks, your Amazons. And they're saying, you know, people are going to be disappointed again. And this productivity is not going to pan out. Right? It turns out that mostly does seem to have panned out. Right? So you can imagine a situation where a boom is justified. Right? But that's, that's the irreducible part of risk. Right? If you bear risk, you have to be able to accept the upside and the downside. So if that risk doesn't pan out, then any previous M2 expansion has to be rolled back. And if prices have risen before, prices are going to have to fall again, and you're going to get a recession until they do. All right, so the big question in monetary policy is going to be, if there's a boom, and it turns out to have been unjustified, and that productivity increase doesn't pan out, how do you make sure there's a soft landing rather than crashing? And this is a hard question. Right? It's not clear that there's a good answer here, or at least we haven't figured one out yet. Another important question would be, how do you identify a, a boom before it happens? And that's not generally going to be possible either, because if you could, then it wouldn't be a boom in the first place. Right? If people could look at something and say, hey, this, is, this doesn't make any sense, this productivity increase isn't going to pan out, everybody's going to be disappointed, if people knew that, then they wouldn't be investing in the first place. And you can't really assume that policymakers are going to have better information than anybody else. The people whose money is on the line have an incentive to have good information. So booms could work out, or they might not, but you never know whether something is unjustified until after the fact. Right? You never can identify a bubble until after it's already crashed. Because if you could, it wouldn't be a bubble in the first place. So let's come back to our taxonomy here. Right, we've answered a, a few of these. Right, we've divided our booms into three types. Right, an increase in bank money, an increase in base money, and an increase in money demand. Any of these are going to be sufficient to cause a boom, because any of these are going to be sufficient to raise the volume of spending. So we've talked about an increase in bank money so far, when there's increases in growth expectations, when people increase their trust in banks. And we have the corresponding three types of recessions. Either because there's a decrease in bank money, a decrease in base money, or an increase in money demand. Right? Any of these are going to be sufficient to send the economy into a recession because any of these are sufficient to decrease the volume of spending. So now we've talked about why bank money might increase, why it might decrease if people lose trust in banks, or why money demand might decrease. For example, if there's a scramble to safety, if people increase their demand for money just to insulate themselves from impending economic disaster. All right, so let's move on to the, uh, the other three then. Let's think about changes in M0 then. Now, as I mentioned before, commercial banks are not able to choose how much money they can issue because the money they do issue is a promise to something. And how many promises they can issue 
is determined by how many promises people are willing to hold and by the amount of money in the economy that they're able to use to fulfill those promises. Now, central banks today, under a fiat money economy, don't issue money that's a promise. They issue money that's not a promise to anything. That's why it's fiat money. So central banks have the ability to issue as much money as they want to. And that's why central banks are generally not profit maximizing, because if they were, they'd issue infinite money because their money is not a promise to pay. And that's why commercial banks can be profit maximizing is because their money is a promise to pay. That's what constrains them. All right, so leaving aside things like a fixed exchange rate or a gold standard, where sometimes central bank issued money is gonna be a promise to pay something else. All right, we'll talk about those cases later when we talk about international macroeconomics. But for now, let's just focus on fiat money economies like the US, where central bank money is not a promise to pay anything. So if it's the case that the supply of base money can be whatever the central bank wants it to be, then what we're gonna to have to ask if we wanna know why M0 would expand is, well, why would the central bank want M0 to expand? So we wanna know who benefits from an increase in the money supply. Well, a few people. First of all, whoever issues the money is gonna benefit. They're gonna get what's called seniorage. Right? And if the government is issuing the money, then the government is gonna benefit from that privilege. Second, whoever gets that money before prices rise is gonna be able to have more purchasing power and buy more things at old prices before prices rise. And then there's gonna be certain people who benefit from an increase in the price level, irrespective of the increase in the money supply. For example, debtors can benefit from inflation because they borrow in more valuable money and then pay back in less valuable money. Right? In terms of purchasing power, inflation is gonna help debtors and hurt creditors. And deflation is gonna do the opposite. It's gonna help creditors and hurt debtors. So you can imagine any of these groups of people might have an interest in M0 expanding. And if they can successfully pressure the central bank to expand, then they're gonna benefit. So before we think about that, it'll be worth thinking about how exactly the central bank is able to change the money supply. What's the process by which it does that? Now, very often people have in mind an image of a money printer, right? something like that. Now, the Federal Reserve doesn't really print money, or at least printing money is a very small part of how money actually enters the economy. The way this is gonna happen is with something called open market operations. Now, an open market operation happens, first of all, when the Treasury is going to issue bonds, right? So the government is going to borrow money. And a lot of times, who ends up buying these government bonds, who ends up lending the government money, is going to be banks. Right? Banks are going to buy some amount of government bonds. So the Federal Reserve, then, is going to be able to buy Treasury bonds from banks in order to expand the money supply, right? So when the Fed buys a bond, from a bank. It's gonna pay for that with new money. And it's gonna deposit that money into the bank's account at the Fed. And so the Fed's gonna hold some amount of government debt. Right? And the more debt that it holds, the more money it's going to issue. And on the other hand, if it wants to contract the money supply, what it's gonna do is it's gonna sell a bond to a bank and then destroy the money that the banks paid for it with. Now, this is a little bit of a circuitous process, so I want to make sure that we have straight the difference between the Treasury and the Fed. Right? They're very different kinds of organizations. Now, the Treasury is going to be in charge of the government's finances. Right? Whenever the government spends any money, the Treasury is going to be in charge of doing that spending. The Federal Reserve doesn't have anything to do with that. Right? The Federal Reserve is in charge of the monetary standard in terms of issuing M0. So the Treasury is going to be able to do what we're going to call fiscal policy in the next lecture. Right? Fiscal policy is when you try to stimulate the volume of spending with government spending. And again, we'll talk about that more next lecture. The Federal Reserve doesn't actually do any spending itself. Right? The Federal Reserve is able to do what's called monetary policy. Now, monetary policy is when the Federal Reserve decides how much M0 there's going to be in the economy. And that's gonna have 
sometimes similar but sometimes different effects from fiscal policy. And we'll be able to compare those later on. Both of them are going to issue assets, and the Treasury is going to be able to issue Treasury bonds. Right? So the government is going to be able to borrow money, and in exchange, it's going to issue an IOU, a Treasury bond, a promise to pay later. Whereas the Federal Reserve is going to be able to issue money that's not a promise to pay anything. Right? So the Federal Reserve is able to buy up those bonds and then create money in exchange. And finally, in terms of how it's run, right? the Treasury is run by the executive branch. Right? It's under the control of the executive branch because it's actually doing the spending that the government wants it to do. It doesn't make sense to have an independent Treasury because you need the Treasury to do what the government needs it to do. Whereas the Federal Reserve is independent, at least ideally independent. It doesn't have to be, but in our case it is. Right? The President can't tell the Fed what to do anymore. So now back to the question of who benefits and why the Federal Reserve might want to expand the money supply. Well, we saw that whoever issues the money benefits. Right? So the Fed benefits and any benefit that it gets, any profit that it makes from issuing that money gets remitted to the government. So the government benefits directly from issuing that money. Right? This is what we call seniorage. And we also saw that inflation benefits debtors. And the government can benefit from monetary expansion both directly and indirectly this way. Directly because the central bank, because it does monetary policy by buying government bonds, the Federal Reserve can increase that demand for bonds. And if the demand for bonds increases, that makes it cheaper to issue bonds. Right? It raises the price of bonds and lowers the interest rate. So the government is now paying less interest on its debt the more bonds that the Fed buys. This is going to entail lower interest rates, which means cheaper borrowing. And the direct benefit would be something called seniorage. Right? So when the Federal Reserve buys government debt, the government doesn't actually pay interest on that debt that the Fed holds. So this is essentially interest-free debt. And this is what we're going to call monetization of the debt. Right? If countries get into a situation where they issue too much debt that they can't pay back, they can actually force the central bank to buy that debt and then not pay interest on that. Now, how do they do that? By creating new money. Right? And then you're going to get high levels of inflation. So let me give you a few examples here. Seniorage has gone on for a very long time, even under commodity standards, right? even under something like a gold or a silver standard, even in ancient Roman times. Right? What you could do is you could call in all of the coins in the realm, which are solid gold coins, let's say, or silver. And you say, hey, bring in all your coins, and in exchange, I'm going to give you two new coins. And you think this is a pretty good deal, right? Two for one, free money, great. But the new coins that you get issued back have maybe a third of the silver content of the previous one. So in terms of the metal, they're less valuable. Now you say, well, wouldn't people just charge a different price for new ones and old ones? Well, yes, they would. And that's why this was highly illegal, right? In order for this to work, the prince had to make it illegal to discriminate between new coins and old coins. And if you did, death penalty. Right, now what was the benefit of doing this? Right, if the prince is able to gather up all these coins and melt them down and give out two coins back, but he's debased it enough that he's able to make three times as many coins out of that same amount of silver, right, he benefits. Right, and this is a way of doing inflation before fiat money. And you can kind of trace the fall of the Roman Empire. As the fiscal situation gets more and more desperate, the silver content gets less and less, it gets debased more and more, until you kind of get a complete collapse of the monetary standard near the end of the Roman Empire. And this is a big factor in the rise of feudalism. You could think of feudalism as a demonetization of the economy because the monetary standard got so bad during this period of time. All right, so there's kind of a reversion. Remember at the very beginning of the class when we talked about the benefits of monetary exchange over customary exchange, all the freedom that you get 
from being able to exchange with money, right? That all reversed at the end of the Roman Empire because money just kind of went away. It became so debased that people reverted to non-monetary exchange and lost a lot of the freedom that they had. And it took a very long time for that to get built back up, for monetary standards to come back into use. You can see this idea of seniorage more recently as well. This is a graph of the price level in the Confederacy during the Civil War. And here again, you can see the fiscal situation gets more and more desperate. So the more money they need immediately, they're not really able to raise taxes to get that money. So they have to issue debt. And if nobody wants to hold that debt, they have to get the central bank to buy that debt and print money in order to do so. All right, so inflation is going to rise in this case. And that's exactly what you see here. After every major battle, the fiscal situation gets a little worse. And so inflation starts to accelerate. So one very common thing you see throughout history is that whether you're on a fiat standard, whether you're on a gold standard or a commodity standard, war is going to be very often associated with inflation. Why? Because inflation is how governments get emergency revenue. If you're not able to raise it quickly through taxes, or if you need it right now in order to prevent the government from collapsing, inflation's a way of getting that. So if you remember Milton Friedman's dictum, when we talked about the quantity theory of money, that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. This is another Nobel Prize winner, Tom Sargent, who makes the point that hyperinflation is always and everywhere a fiscal phenomenon. What does he mean by that? He means that hyperinflation is still a monetary phenomenon, right? You still get hyperinflation by increasing the money supply. But why does that happen? Well, governments are only incentivized to increase the money supply that much when the fiscal situation is so bad that that's the only way that they can get revenue. This was the situation during Weimar Germany when Germany had a bunch of war debts imposed upon it after World War I. And also the political situation was such that nobody could agree on a budget. And so in order to keep the lights on, they had to issue lots and lots of money in order to just keep things running. More recently in Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe was so corrupt that there was just no possibility of maintaining a budget. And so the only way to keep the lights on again is to issue lots and lots of money. That's how you get hyperinflation. You get the central bank to buy up all that government debt. And currently in Venezuela, right? Because the budget was so dependent on high oil prices that when oil prices decreased a little bit, the only way to maintain that level of spending, the only way to keep up the sort of waste that had been possible was to have the Venezuelan central bank issue lots and lots of money in order to buy up that debt. This is how you get hyperinflation, right? They only have an incentive to do that when the fiscal situation is so bad that there's really no other alternative. That's how you get things like a million percent inflation. So things only really get bad inflation-wise when you've got really bad fiscal policy, right? When the government is going to be able to force the central bank to keep it afloat. So you see here kind of a divergence in interests between the government and its people. Right? The government might sometimes have an interest in higher inflation than would be good for the economy in general, just because it benefits from that kind of inflation. So one way of dealing with that problem is what we call central bank independence. Right? Central bank independence is the ability of the central bank to say no to the central government. When the government tries to force the central bank to buy its debt, to monetize that debt and to keep the lights on. The central bank is able to say no. And if the central bank is not able to say no, it's really hard to keep the government's hands out of the cookie jar, so to speak. So what you see up here is that the more independent a central bank is, the lower inflation is going to be. Because if a government knows that that option of increasing the money supply and getting more revenue that way, if it knows that that's off the table, then there's more of an incentive to be fiscally responsible. Right? And so you're going to get lower inflation that way. There's going to be less pressure on the central bank to expand the money supply and to buy that government debt. And so you see a pretty strong negative relationship here. 
Right? And this, as a matter of fact, goes from 1955 through 1988. So this is a fairly old graph. Right? And New Zealand up here is interesting, right? Because New Zealand was one of the first to, after the gold standard, make its central bank independent. And during the 1980s, New Zealand made its central bank independent and brought its average inflation rate down from way above that eight or nine percent down to about you know, two or three. Right? And that averages out to about seven or eight percent over this time period. Right? So New Zealand was a huge success story in terms of central bank independence. And that inflation throughout the world in the 70s and 80s, after the world went off the gold standard and realized that it was now possible to finance budget deficits by creating money much more easily than was possible before. Right? After New Zealand had this success throughout the world, countries adopted independent central banks. And inflation since the 1980s worldwide has been fairly low in most places with independent central banks. After Nixon, the US realized the importance of this too. Right? And so whereas Nixon was able to threaten Arthur Burns, the chairman of the Fed, and say, hey, if you don't do what I want, I'll replace you with somebody who will. The president's not able to do that anymore. So a couple years ago, Trump was kind of bloviating about, well, Jerome Powell is raising interest rates too much. He's not doing what I like with monetary policy. It would be better if he would maybe monetize the debt a little more, if he would keep interest rates low. Maybe that would help with my popularity, with re-election basically trying to do the same thing that Nixon was doing. But the difference now is that whereas Arthur Burns was kind of forced to do what Nixon wants to, Jerome Powell can say, buzz off. And that's good, right? You want the central bank to be able to keep the central government's hands out of the cookie jar. And that's a big part of the reason why inflation has been so low throughout the developed world ever since the 1990s. So governments do have an incentive, sometimes, to increase the money supply not only for revenue purposes, but also because it can cause a boom. Now, not only is this boom going to be temporary, but it's also going to hurt the economy in the long run, as we saw, because this gives us overemployment, this draws pseudo-unemployed resources into production that you don't want to be used for production currently. And it's going to hurt the economy in the long run. It's going to make the economy more fragile and less resilient to shocks. So central bank independence gives the central bank the power to say no. And you can take away those incentives to manipulate the economy for electoral purposes. Right, so the US realized this was important after Nixon and after seeing that New Zealand had such success with it. So both for booms and for revenue, central bank independence is important for keeping monetary policy about where you or I would want it. It's a way of aligning the incentives of the government and the people. Now, we spent a lot of time on M0 increasing now. And what we might want to know is, does M0 ever decrease? Is there ever a time when the Federal Reserve would have an incentive to cut the money supply and maybe cause a recession that way? This is pretty rare, right? Because the government has an incentive for a number of reasons, both for revenue and for booms, to increase the money supply and to increase the volume of spending. It's really not much of an incentive to cut it because you're gonna cause a recession that's gonna make your political leaders less popular. Uh, you're gonna maybe decrease government revenue that way. And so in general, governments are not gonna do this unless they're forced to. Sometimes if there's a fixed exchange rate or a gold standard or some other situation where the central bank's money is a promise to something, Sometimes they can, they can be forced to. This was the situation in a few countries during the gold standard in the Great Depression. Right? They were forced to cut the money supply for this reason. But in a fiat money economy, the Federal Reserve will basically never be forced to do this and will never have an incentive to do this. Right? So we're not gonna worry too much about this case. This is gonna be a pretty remote case. So that leaves us one more of our six reasons. When might the demand for money fall? Well, imagine you open the paper and the headline says that, well, the Federal Reserve is no longer independent and they're gonna double the money supply next week. What's your reaction? What are you gonna do? Well, you probably wanna get out ahead of that. 
right? You know prices haven't risen yet, but you've taken macroeconomics now, so you know prices are gonna rise. So you wanna spend your money before prices rise. And you wanna do that as quickly as possible. So this is gonna decrease your demand for money. You're gonna rather, at this point, spend the money rather than keep it, right? Because all the money that you keep is gonna be less valuable after next week. So when might this happen? Isn't this kind of a fanciful example too? Well, in 2015, there were rumors that Greece was gonna leave the Eurozone and go back to the drachma, right? Because the fiscal situation in Greece was so bad and it was causing so many problems that Greece was relying on monetization before and now that they're part of the Eurozone, they don't have their own central bank, so they can't rely on monetization anymore. So the government wasn't able to keep the lights on, or it almost wasn't. So there were rumors that it was gonna leave the Eurozone in order to get back the ability to have a central bank buy its debt. And if it does that, right, if it reverts to the drachma, leaves the Eurozone and gets back its own central bank, the reason it would do that is for revenue purposes. And you know, that if a government's relying on the central bank for revenue, there's gonna be inflation. So back in 2015, when it was looking very likely that Greece was gonna do this, Greek citizens wanted to get ahead of this, right? So people in Greece really decreased their demand for money over this period of time, right? Because if they were holding any euros at the time when Greece leaves the Eurozone, Greece would buy those back at a very unfavorable rate and they'd lose a lot of purchasing power for any, any euros that they held at the time. They got converted to drachmas. So because they feared this inflation, you got a little mini boom in Greece during this time. So you see things like car sales, TV sales, jewelry, all of these things, anything other than money, people are gonna wanna hold, right? Because if you're not sure that your money is gonna be as valuable next week, here's a quote from a, uh, a coffee shop owner who talks to his customers about these kinds of things. People were explicitly thinking in these terms, right? If my money's gonna be less valuable next week, why not spend the money? And so they've been going out on shopping sprees, right? They don't wanna lose that money when Greece converts that back to drachmas. All right, so high inflation is gonna make money less useful as that store of value, right? That important function of money, it's gonna make it less able to fulfill that purpose. And so if people expect inflation, if they expect money to be a less useful store of value in the future, they're going to have a lower demand for money and they're going to have a higher demand for goods. They're going to try to get rid of that money and look for other stores of value, maybe real estate, maybe goods, jewelry, maybe cryptocurrency even, right? When there were rumors in Cyprus that there's going to be a wealth tax, Right, that's another kind of situation where your money is gonna be a less good store of value. And so those rumors were the first time that Bitcoin really took off, when it went from like $10 to $1,000 initially. Right, that was because of those rumors of the wealth tax in Cyprus. Right, so whenever the prospects of money becoming less useful as a medium of exchange or a store of value, whenever those prospects look likely, people are gonna decrease their demand for money. Money is gonna become less useful for them. And so this can exacerbate the problem of inflation. This is kind of the reverse of that double downward dip that we saw at the beginning of this lecture. All right, so let's come back to the equation of exchange here. All right, let's suppose that bad budgeting leads governments to inflate. So Greece wants to rely on the central bank to cover its budget deficit. So M is gonna rise. Right, the central bank is going to issue that money into the economy in order to cover that budget deficit. And if people see this coming, they're going to reduce their demand for money. So the demand for money is going to fall. People are going to rather spend it than hold it. And so velocity is going to rise. Right, and these problems reinforce each other. This is what we sometimes call a flight into goods, especially when it gets more severe, when people don't want to hold money at all. They'd rather hold any kind of other store of value because money's such a bad store of value in high inflation situations. Here's an example of this. In the late 1990s in Russia, right, Russia's just coming off of communism and it's struggling. Right? It's having a really hard time covering its budget deficit. And so inflation in Russia was pretty high in the early 90s, 
but by the late 90s, it had managed to get it under control, and it's under 10% annually. But the budget's still in heavy deficit. Right? And in order to keep going, right, they announced that they're going to have to increase the money supply by 40%. Right? So that fanciful example at the beginning of this section, right? not really that fanciful. This is almost exactly what Russia did in the late 1990s. So based on the quantity theory, if the supply of money increases by 40%, what do you expect inflation to be the next year? Well, 40%, right? But here's the thing. The quantity theory assumes that the demand for money is relatively constant, which in normal times is a pretty good assumption. But in cases like this, where you get a flight into goods situation, if inflation is so high that people want to get out before the inflation hits, then the demand for money is going to fall while the supply of money is rising. So you get that double hit. So in Russia, you know you're going to get at least 40% inflation. But because money demand dropped, prices jumped almost 67%. Right? So another 27 percentage points of inflation because of money demand dropping. Right? That's your flight into goods. And so you get kind of a double whammy here. Not only is the supply increasing, but the demand is decreasing. So that takes us to the end of our taxonomy of booms and recessions. All right, so remember our three types of booms are an increase in bank money, an increase in base money, or a decrease in money demand. All right, the increase in bank money we saw happens when there's increased growth expectations, when people become more confident in future growth and banks are able to make more loans and issue more money. That can cause that kind of boom. When a government has fiscal problems, or maybe it's an election year, right, there can be an increase in base money. Right? And central bank independence is a way of preventing this kind of boom. And our third is going to be decrease in money demand. This is when you get the flight into goods, uh, when there's expected inflation in the future and you want to get out ahead of that. And corresponding to these are going to be our three types of recessions. Right, we can get a recession either from a decrease in bank money, a decrease in base money, or an increase in money demand. A decrease in bank money can happen when people lose trust in banks, when either the banking system is fragile or there's a situation that lots of loans are turning bad, and so people want to get their money out of banks. And so banks are going to be forced to contract. And that can cause a recession when M2 contracts. It's going to be pretty rare for M0 to contract, but occasionally that can happen when governments are forced to when their money is a promise to pay something else. We'll talk more about that situation when we get to international macro. And finally, a recession can happen when there's an increase in money demand or velocity falls, right? when people would rather hold money rather than spend it, and so that flow is going to slow down. Right? This is what we're going to call the scramble to safety. When people would rather have more money, they'd rather hold on to money, rather than any kinds of promises to pay. So now we're going to ask a question, what do we do about these? Right? What can a government do to counteract booms and recessions? And it has a few tools at its disposal. But the main two tools are going to be things called monetary policy, which as we saw the central bank administers, and fiscal policy, which as we saw was administered by the treasury, by government spending. That's what we're going to talk about next unit. And next unit, we're going to be able to put all of this together and really talk about how different kinds of government policies affect the economy. So the recent situation is not exactly a recession. Right? It's an economic contraction, but it's a real economic contraction. And so that's going to look somewhat different from a recession right? in ways that we'll be able to talk more about uh, next time. Right, so if you've thought that this is all kind of of dubious application to the recent situation, if it's maybe more applicable to 2008, next lecture is where we're going to be able to bring all this together, and we're going to have a general way of talking about the effects of government responses to both real shocks and nominal shocks, and the kinds of effects that those can have. So we'll be able to talk more about current events in the next lecture. So I hope you'll look forward to that. In the meantime, the reading assignment for this week is going to be chapter 16 on monetary policy. I'll see you then, and have a good evening.